protests in Cuba. Uh, people are in the streets, or at least they were. Uh, the story today is that the, uh, the police are in the streets. Right? Yeah. And uh, Leonardo Flores is on the line with us, Latin American policy analyst and campaigner with Code Pink, codepink.org. Um, Leonardo EFA is his Twitter handle, and Code Pink is, uh, of course, at Code Pink on, on Twitter. Uh, CodePink.org as well, if I, if I didn't say that already. I think I did. Leonardo, welcome to the program. Uh, tell us what's the, what's the story behind the story here. I'm, I'm assuming it has an awful lot to do with uh, the Trump administration changing the Obama administration policies toward Cuba. I was, uh, Louise and I, my wife and I were down in Cuba for a week on a trip that you guys put together, Code Pink. Um, back when when uh, President Obama was president, and it was you know, quite the place. We had a marvelous time, um, but things changed considerably under Trump. Yeah, that's right. Thanks so much for the invitation, Tom. First of all, sure. And uh, really, we have to say that it goes beyond Trump. This story, that what's behind the protest, really, is the 60-plus year embargo that the United States has imposed on Cuba. It's an economic war that has affected every person in Cuba. Uh, and it's really affected every you know, sector of society and the economy. And so people, you know, we're talking about thousands of people that took to the streets on Sunday to protest basically two things. One is the economic conditions that are, the Cuban people are currently facing. And second, there was an uptick in a uh, surge in, in COVID cases that collapsed the hospital in the state of Matanzas in Cuba. And people are very upset about that. But of course, we all have to put this in perspective. So when we talk about thousands of people on the streets in Cuba, it really is you know, quite possibly the biggest protest in Cuba in 30 years. But, you know, the, the Cuban revolution itself routinely turns out hundreds of thousands, if not a million people for their own uh, marches and rallies. So, um, you know, in two weeks, it's going to be the anniversary of July 26th, part of the a huge date for the Cuban revolution. And I'm sure we're going to see hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in Cuba supporting the revolution. So it's all it has to be kept in perspective. And, but yeah, you're right. A big part of it has to do with the Trump administration because they worsened sanctions on Cuba during the pandemic. They imposed sanctions on the energy, tourism, banking, and other sectors, and they limited uh, remittances that Cuban Americans sent back to the island, and they also limited travel as well. All right. So, uh, and, and you know, which has just got a—it's just tightening the screws. I mean, it's it's uh, terribly tightening the screws. So are there any indications that the Biden administration, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this kind of tough talk and I'm guessing that they're pandering to the, uh, particularly to the, to the Cuban American vote in, in South Florida that tends to go very Republican. I don't, I don't know why they even bother, but um, uh, you know, he's saying, well, you know, we're going to, we're with the Cuban people, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, but is there any serious discussion in our government today of going back to the Obama era policies of uh, essentially liberalizing our relationship with Cuba? That you know, when when Louise and I were there, they, one of the things that we found was that there were all these little restaurants that were opening all over all over town. I mean, you know, cat, free enterprise. If you want to, you know, I, I'm not sure you could call it full blown capitalism, but free enterprise was flourishing when we were there, at least in Havana and some of the and the, the one of the small town that we visited. Um, the government has been adopting what you might call some, uh, arguably some progressive changes. Um, what's the status of our government's relationship to, to that? It seemed like we were helping them move in the right direction. Right. So when President Biden was campaigning, he actually promised to go back to the Obama era policy, which was basically re-engagement, reproachment. There was uh, the you know, diplomatic ties between the countries were fully restored. There was this kind of an impulse towards lifting the blockade. Oh, that didn't happen, of course. But now what we're seeing is that because of these protests, because of particularly from the reaction in the white right, from the right wing in Florida, as you said, the Biden administration seems to be pulling back a bit. Uh, they, you know, I think he had a statement yesterday or the day before where he called on you know Cuban the Cuban authorities to grant the Cuban people the right to really determine their own future. But that's impossible in the context of a blockade of an embargo, of course. The embargo cost Cuba something like, that has cost Cuba $150 billion over the last six years. And it also cost the U.S. economy quite a bit. The Chamber of Commerce says that it costs $1.2 billion a year to the U.S. economy itself, while the Cuba Policy Foundation places that number at $4.8 billion. But we haven't seen the Biden administration take any steps towards Cuba. Uh, when they've been called on it by the press, the reaction has been, well, we're reviewing the policy right now. 
And basically what, what we understand the Cuba followers and analysts is that the administration is focusing on Iran uh, and they don't want to jeopardize talks with Iran if and they feel that they might in terms of what the Senate will do if they also take on the issue of Cuba right now. They don't think they can walk and chew gum at the same time? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. They can't do it because, in part, because of Robert Menendez, an important Democratic senator from New Jersey, who was also Cuban American, Cuban American, and very much against the Obama era's policy. But we're uh. seeing a huge groundswell of support from the grassroots to lift the embargo, and in Congress as well. Just last March, there were 80 House Democrats wrote a letter to President Biden urging him to lift the Trump era sanctions and begin again this process of normalization with relations with Cuba. If you, I mean, the, the, the big lesson that I got from, from the time that Louise and I spent there was that if you think that helping Cuba move out of a, a, a somewhat rigid uh, communist or neo-communist or whatever you want to call it, you know, state, entirely state-run model into a, uh, the beginnings of a, of a free enterprise model where people can um, start small businesses, and, and, but, but very, very limited uh, in the, so that they're not mis repeating essentially the mistakes we're making, where now we have an economy that is completely dominated by giant monopolies. I, I, I would not call our economy free at all. Um, but if you want to see the move in a direction that seems like a, a positive, what at least seemed to me a positive direction, um, then engage them, right? You know, allow tourism, allow trade. Uh, you know, it's. I, I realize I'm, I'm. I may be sounding a little like a, a, a classic neoliberal here, but um, correct me if I'm if I'm off in some kind of fantasy here, Leonardo. I, I, no. I think, I think you're right. I mean, if I, if the idea from the United States is to influence Cuba in a positive way. And the only way to do that is to have diplomatic relations, to engage in trade, to engage in a free exchange of ideas. None of that is happening right now because of the Trump sanctions and because of the limits uh, that the Trump, Trump administration put on the bilateral relationship with Cuba. On top of that, you know, Cuba is a country that just had and wrote a new constitution that submitted it to a referendum in 2019. It was something like 81 percent voter turnout. Ninety percent of the people voted yes to this new constitution, which includes some sort of liberalization, so to speak, of the economy, including the right to private to own property. So we are seeing some steps in that direction. But it should also be noted that Cuba, despite all these difficulties, despite the economic warfare of the United States for over 60 years, Cuba is a country that has high human development, according to the United Nations Development Program. And that's because Cuba, for the last 60 years, has been investing in health care, in education, in, so in the social safety net, in, a, you know, in, in contrast to, say, the United States, which has been investing in war and police for the past 60 right. years. And we see a, you know, a big marked, marked difference there. Oh, and that was very clear. And uh, I, I mean, Cuba's major export is doctors, for God's sake. Um, uh, last question here. We're going to run out of time in a minute. but. Um, what is, you know, when we were there, they were, uh, in fact, we visited one of the, one of the medical schools and they were developing, uh, you know, remedies and, and new drugs and things uh, that were just, I mean, cutting edge stuff. What is the status of vaccination for COVID in Cuba right now? Do they have access to, to you know, Pfizer? Do they have access to our pharmaceuticals? Are they buying them from China or from Russia? Are they developing their own? What's going on there with that in that context? They don't have any access to the, you know, the COVAX system, which is and, and other private vaccines, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. In fact, Cuba is actually developing five of its own vaccines. And my understanding is that two of those have already been approved by Cuban health authorities, and they have a 91 percent and a 92 percent efficiency rating. So very successful vaccines that they're developing. Already two million Cubans have been vaccinated, which only represents roughly around 20 percent of the population. And the biggest restriction right now, the biggest impediment to vaccinating the entire population is that there's a shortage of syringes in Cuba. And that shortage is, again, entirely due to the U.S. embargo on Cuba. In fact, wow. at Code Pink, with global health partners and other organizations, we just raised around $500,000 to buy syringes and send them to Cuba for their vaccination program. Wow. On top of that, Cuba has promised to produce 100 million vaccines that it will share with the Global South. So really, if Cuba can get going with its vaccination program and can solidify these vaccines that they're developing, it's going to be a big boom to people all over the world who don't also don't have access to the vaccine.